Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, really happy that many people are here online today for uh, our annual Cress Talks. Huh? The Samuel H. Cress Foundation offers to American PhD students funding to come to the Art History Department at Leiden University. This year, we're very happy to have Cynthia Koch and Margaret Mansfield with us. In their talks today, both will focus on particular aspects of their uh, PhD. And actually, we're sitting in the same room. This is the very first time we can do that, thanks to the, the new, uh, res the, the less restricted Corona uh, rules. All right, our first speaker is uh, Cynthia Koch. She is a PhD candidate in history of art at Yale University. Her work focuses on the material culture of trade and empire, and she is currently writing a dissertation on sensorial engagement and craft experiments with mother of pearl in the early modern Dutch world. Cynthia received her uh, MA from Bard Graduate Center and her BA from the University of California, Berkeley. And she has worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Frick Collection and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Today, she will talk about her PhD subject, Mother of Pearl and Material Literacy in the Early Modern Dutch World. Cynthia, the floor is yours. Thank you to the Crest Foundation for supporting this research and to Stein for that great introduction and for organizing these talks. And I will get started. The Belkin family used Mother of Pearl to define their art and legacy. When Jeremy Belkin moved to Amsterdam in the early 17th century, he was still primarily a musket engraver. Two generations later, his grandson, Cornelius Belkin, perhaps the most prolific carver in his family, had become famous for objects such as this Nautilus cup, which he engraved with a scene of Venus and Cupid and carved with a low relief whales surrounding the shell's central spiral. The Belkin's work with Nautilus shell, however, only made up a small portion of their body of work. In fact, they refer to themselves more generally as mother of pearl in layers, carvers or engravers, and more frequently carved small plaques or roundels, usually decorated with biblical or mythological scenes. In this talk, I focus on these small handheld plaques to consider how Mother of Pearl shaped the Belkin's craft methods and artistic identity. The family lived and worked in Amsterdam at a time when the Dutch East India trade made resources like Mother of Pearl more accessible to European makers. Yet without established methods for manipulating shell, Mother of Pearl workers experimented to understand a range of techniques, including how to chemically erode the shell's outer layer, as well as how to engrave images onto the shell. Their methods responded to the unique materiality of Mother of Pearl while remaining grounded in Dutch modes of craft. In particular, they consciously chose to engage with image making, often modeling their scenes after print precedents. In emphasizing both their ability to be technically innovative and their fluency in Dutch craft conventions, the Belicans fashioned themselves as not only competent craftsmen, but also inventive artists who are intellectually engaged with a local community of makers and collectors. So first, a brief explanation of Mother of Pearl. Mother of Pearl or nacre is an iridescent, flexible, and chemically stable material that makes up the body of many types of shells, including nautiluses and pearl oysters. Regardless of the form of shell, the living mollusk produces on a microscopic level a composite organic-inorganic material of argonite platelets that make up layers of nacre. And here is a microscopic view of the mother of pearl where you can see the layers of composite material. The early 18th century dictionary or general treatise of various medicines describes how oysters form pearls and mother of pearl with an incremental building up of nacre. The material is, quote, produced by natural additions of very thick and shiny layers in the manner of onion skins, which afterwards have hardened, unquote. The structure of semi-translucent platelets 
not only accounts for the iridescence of mother of pearl, but also the material's flexibility, strength, and impermeability. Unlike nautilus shells, which could only be found, nacreous oyster shells were more easily accessible as a byproduct of the pearl trade. Coastal communities on the Indian subcontinent and the Indonesian islands had farmed Pinctada margaritifera and Pinctada maxima long before European merchants established imperial outposts in those areas. By the late 17th century, the Dutch East India Company had access to the South China Sea and the Gulf of Manar between India and Sri Lanka and controlled the pearl fisheries along the Coromandel Coast, Sri Lanka, and Indonesian islands. A 1682 Dutch report re recorded 31 pearl oyster banks off the coast of India. A later survey identified 47. While shell specimen collecting relied heavily on private trade, pearl fisheries extracted pearls by the ton. To see if an oyster contained a pearl, the entire shell had to be taken out of the reef and pried open. The tons of extracted mother of pearl were then shipped to the Netherlands as a raw material rather than collecting cabinet novelty. By the 18th century, the VOC was importing an average of over 5,000 pounds of shell a year from the East Indies. Extant ship manifest, inventories, and advertisements mention, quote, barrels of mother of pearl alongside, quote, crates of tea arriving in Amsterdam. For example, the Amsterdam Zakorant specified that the ship Tolstoyne had 3,000 pounds of mother of pearl in its cargo. Once trading ships arrived in Amsterdam, makers could access wholesale mother of pearl at market sites like the Amsterdam Exchange. As a master mechanic and engraver of muskets, Jeremy Bellican likely already worked with mother of pearl Weapons for wealthy patrons would have been elaborately inlaid with mother of pearl and ivory, engraved with decorative figures or scenes. Jeremy's son John and grandson Cornelius, however, did not continue making weapons. Jean Bellican was the first in his family to officially call himself a paramour in legger in the 1627 notarial document I showed earlier. Cornelius, either John's son or nephew, similarly worked primarily with pearl oyster shells. In some of his carvings, such as the shell depicting Perseus and Andromeda, Cornelius Bellican preserved the shape of the pearl oyster. To begin, Cornelius would have had to immerse the oyster shell in an acid or strong vinegar to strip the dull yellow or brownish outer skin. The shell's layered growth makes it possible for parts of it to be eroded without weakening its overall construction. He would then continue to polish the shell until the pearly layer became visible before cutting the shell into a desired shape, often an oval or rectangle lid for a snuff box. In this example, Cornelius uses the shape of the shell to make his composition more dynamic. He fits Perseus, brandishing a sword and Medusa shield, into the angled upper curve of the shell, emphasizing motion as Pegasus swoops towards the sea monster. Many of the Bellican's carved plaques were set as decorative lids for small boxes, like the one shown here, although they were also collected as individual works. Early 18th century inventories, such as that of Aranis Vandenberg, an apothecary in Amsterdam, included a snuff box of tortoise shell with a mother of pearl lid decorated with a carving by Cornelius Bellican of the Bath of Callisto. A variety of similar boxes survive with lids retaining a shell shape or cut into round or octagonal plaques. Some featured elaborate low relief carving and black and engravings but many are also unsigned and undecorated, suggesting that makers offered these boxes at a range of price points. Even as mother of pearl boxes became more popular in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, there's never a specific guild for mother of pearl workers. Into the 18th century, many carvers continue to have trained as gold and silver smiths. Mother of pearl carver Jan Bernard Brachhausen officially worked as a stamp cutter at the Helderson Mint in Hardewijk. Norbert Halebrook, similarly, was nominated Mint Master in Bruges in, 16, in 1749, although he was transferred to the Mint in Brussels after a counterfeiting accusation. Already, metal was a popular material for small boxes. In addition to silver, brass and copper boxes were affordable alternatives. Metal smiths engraved box lids with shallowly carved decoration, 
similar to metal plates prepared for printing. Mother of Pearl craftsmen transferred these metalworking skills using burns, hammers, and chisels to carve and engrave the shell. Hale Brook, for example, designed this box with six panels of Mother of Pearl cut into rectangles and polished flat and secured with a gold frame and hinged lid. He inscribes the panels of, the, he, of his box with complex figural scenes depicting an allegory of the arts and mythological figures, blackening the engravings with ink or charcoal to make them legible. Although mother of pearl carvers might have worked closely with metalsmiths and used the tools and techniques of engravers, their primary focus remained on the shell itself. In fact, for the Belican shells, the metal box was often a later 18th century addition. For example, a box now in the Amsterdam Museum has a Belican lid with the same scene of Perseus rescuing Andromeda. The metal, however, is stamped with hallmarks of 18th century silversmith Louis Metaille. The Belican family perhaps started their mother of pearl enterprise in Amsterdam at a moment when makers were beginning to define their craft by the specific material with which they worked. William Kick gained a patent for his lacquer work that mimicked Japanese chests and called himself a lacquer worker. Others, like cabinet maker Hermann Domer, made a name for themselves working with imported material like ebony. In 1696, Cornelius Billiken placed a newspaper advertisement in their Amsterdam's Tonders da Courant that read, Cornelius Billiken, artist, has invented an instrument with which he can drill diamonds, pearls, agates, etc., which also improve all pearls that have yellow or darker membranes or also large holes. He makes them cleaner and the holes smaller. In addition, he carves images on mother of pearl and also many different scenes on various substances. This advertisement focuses on Cornelius, on how Cornelius invented tools and working methods to refine his craft and suggests that he had broad expertise in working with all kinds of unusual materials. Like other artisans work with lacquer or ebony, mother of pearl plaques must be situated in context of a broader interest in experimenting with material capabilities, particularly materials that had become increasingly accessible through Dutch trade networks. Mother of pearl's chemical stability perhaps made it especially popular for small personal containers. The material had no taste or smell that could contaminate a box's contents. Snuff, for example, was often scented with oils. It was important to limit exposure to air to maintain the powder's potency and fragrance. Not only was the polished iridescent mother of pearl visually striking, the inert material would protect the box's contents from the environments without reacting to it. Other materials with comparable plastic qualities include whale baleen, horn, and tortoise shell. While Hermannus van der Brugge's box with a mother of pearl lid, mm. not sure. No, there's something with the. Okay, it seems okay. Oh, all yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, which slide? The I am on slide 20. 20. But continue, it will be my problem, I guess. Okay. Oh, well, hopefully it yes, comes it's, back. It's okay. okay. Um, while Hermannus van den Broek's box with the mother of pearl lid and tortoiseshell body is no longer extant, it may have looked similar to these two boxes. The box on the left with the lid depicting a port scene, for example, is made of translucent pressed baleen. In the 17th century, the States General granted makers exclusive patents to experiment with such materials to create airtight waterproof containers. Like mother of pearl, horn and baleen were durable and chemically inert, in addition to being moldable. Makers cut sheets of horn into quotidian objects like lanterns, combs, and cutlery. Baleen was shaped into boxes, frames, medallions, and other small decorative objects. In the two extant version of, versions of Cornelius' Perseus and Andromeda, we can see how the mother of pearl carver continued to experiment with the shape and materiality of the shell to refine his composition. The carving on the left, likely earlier, relies on darkly inked foliage and rocks to make the reclining figure of Andromeda stand out. In the shell on the right, Cornelius uses simple line work rather than charcoal to define details in the background. 
Already, Cornelius was quoting, directly quoting Jan Saradam's print of Perseus and Andromeda, which itself was after Hendrik Colgius' print. While Cornelius more or less transcribes the composition, he also reinterprets the scale and perspective to suit his new medium. In comparison to the print, Cornelius shrinks the chain Andromeda, rebalancing the three central figures to give them more equal weight. Instead of dark shading, Cornelius gives the monster scales, emphasizing its fish-like qualities. Where Sardon uses the density of his engraved lines to suggest light and shadow, Cornelius carves Andromeda, Perseus, and the sea monster in low relief, using the reflection of light on the shell to give them a sense of dimensionality. Andromeda's face is more fully in profile rather than the three quarters turn used in the print. And while Cornelius could have chosen to model the scene entirely in low relief, he still uses the sketchy lines of print to denote the waves under the sea monster, the shrubs and rocky cliffs of the background, and the speckled shore. Not only did Cornelius place his work in dialogue with printmaking, he reworks and refines the composition. While the earlier inked carving still copies the skull and bones Saradam includes on the shore, Cornelius chooses in his later carving to only show a scattering of shells. With great demand for mother of pearl, the Belicans might have easily made a living with undecorated shell boxes. An 18th century box made with six panels of mother of pearl exemplifies perhaps a less refined style, which would have still been in demand. Even without additional decorative elements, the mother of pearl is ornamental and visually striking. Yet drawing and engraving seems to always have been an important component of the way the, in which the Bellicans approach their craft. When Jan Bellican accepts apprentice Peter Cornelissen in 1627, the contract specifies that Cornelissen would practice drawing in his free time or on Sundays. Cornelius Bellican himself seems to even have trained as a fine artist. He paints at least four peasant dance scenes including one now in the Museum Bradius collection, and he makes and signs at least one copper engraving. However, by the last quarter of the 17th century, Cornelius seems to focus primarily on carving and engraving Mother of Pearl, a turn to more mythological scenes like Perseus and Andromeda, rather than the peasant festivals that characterize his early painting and carving, is perhaps another deliberate choice he makes to appeal to a more elevated market. In the Amsterdam Zakaran advertisement, Cornelius uses the term kunstenaar to describe himself. In addition to inventing instruments for working mother of pearl, he also signals his intellectual engagement in his work. In a craft culture that inherited Renaissance ideas of ingenium and privileged image making, perhaps being considered an artist rather than primarily an engraver was a claim to a more elevated status. More than an interest in status, however, the Belicans emphasized creativity in their self-fashioning. The family not only invented their own tools and trained in image making, they also coined the designation of mother of pearl worker to differentiate the craft as something new, as distinctly both materially and intellectually innovative. I would like to conclude by briefly considering what is gained and what is lost as imagery transverses material from paper to shell to paper again. In Alberta Seva's 1734 thesaurus of animal specimens, a printmaker translates the Belican's carved shells back into print. While the rest of volume three of the thesaurus features engravings of oceanic creatures from long-legged crabs to blood red coral, this page of 22 randalls seems like simple vignettes until you look closely at the pastel washes of blues and pinks that the colorist has carefully applied to each mother of pearl fragment. The text accompanying this plate explains how the artist reveals the quote sheen of silver and converts the shell from a quote dirty brown into an object quote remarkable for the beauty of the engravings with which they have been adorned unquote. That is made remarkable by the craftsperson. The thesaurus acknowledges the transformative power of artistry, a combination of technique and imagination. One of the plaques once in Seba's collection is now in the Amsterdam Museum. Even when returned to a printed image, Cornelius's roundel retains a sense of dimensionality and tactility, as if it could be picked up 
to reanimate the iridescence of the shell and clarify the shadowed figures on the outer curve. The objects that the Bellicans crafted demanded close hands-on engagement. Such carved shell fragments became not only markers of fashionability, but also sites of tangible encounter between people and their increasingly globalized material worlds. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That was uh, very, very interesting. It's, it's fascinating to see how first the prints are, are taken as example, and then all of a sudden it works uh, in such a way that, that it, it, it gets printed again or represented in print as such. So, so it's, it's truly fascinating. We keep the questions for later. So please put all your questions you have for Cynthia, but also for Margaret in uh, the chat and we will do them all at the end but let me first introduce margaret mansfield she's a doctoral candidate at the university of california santa barbara margaret's research examines travelogues about the indian subcontinent produced translated and disseminated by the dutch to a variety of european audiences she is especially exploring the impact of the social networks of the authors, engravers, publishers, and financers on the production and reuse of images of the rituals and the religions of the Indian subcontinent. The title of our talk today is Ramping Up Publications in Colombia, Dueling Dutch Accounts of India and its Religious Practices in a Year of Disaster. George. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Stein, for the lovely introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucas, for being a, a host to both Cindy and I while we are here as Cress Fellows and the broader Leiden community and even uh, the Dutch art historical and historical scholarly community. Um, being here uh, is immensely helpful, even in a uh, our own sort of year of disaster in uh, the pandemic that we've been going through, but it has been um, such a great experience, so I want to um, express my thanks for that. Okay. Het Rampiar means the disaster year. After living through 2020 and 2021, this is a term with which many of us can likely deeply, deeply empath empathize. To the early modern Dutch person, the disastrous year that garnered the label Het Rampiar was 1672. This was only 24 years after the establishment of the Dutch Republic's independence from Spain in 1648. It was a year that was the newly established Republic almost did not survive. It was a year, um, sorry, uh, the Dutch were at war with England uh, via Charles II, France with Louis XIV, Cologne and Munster under the leadership of the Bishop, stretching their military to near collapse. Warfare with France and Munster meant not just infiltration of the cities and villages, but also the reinstitution of Catholicism in the Reformed uh, Republic, a very Protestant place. Following the death of Willem II, the Stadthouder, and the Prince of Orange in 1650, uh, he was not replaced with his newborn son, uh, who was far too young at the time, um, as would occur if a monarchical uh, legislation were in place, but what began was a Stadthouderless period. Uh, the states general managed to run the very um, managed to run the government without a stadtholder, but tensions between anti-monarchical, pro-true freedom Republicans under the leadership of those like the Rod Pensionaris van Holland, Johan de Witt, against the pro-House of Orange contingent were very high. So on top of international warfare, um, there was also domestic political unrest and active uh, warfare within the Dutch Republic uh, at the time. And on top of all of this was the worst uh, stock market crash that the Amsterdam Stock Exchange had ever experienced. So external fighting, internal fighting, stock market crash um, also led to widespread rioting amongst the people across the Republic. For example, the citizens of Utrecht revolted on 15 of June, taking over the city from the government. Um, so 1672 had widespread consequences for people of all levels of society in all parts of the Dutch Republic. 
Uh, it was a year in which the people were described as redolos or irrational, its government as radolos, distraught, and the country as redolos and beyond salvation. By the end of the summer, the people had had enough of the political, economic, and religious disaster and riots and be, uh, that had become more widespread and more frequent. By the 4th of August, Johann de Witt, had, who had formerly been of extreme power, uh, the top seat in government and society, uh, and his brother, Cornelius de Witt, um, who had been the deputy of famed, uh, uh, famed um, naval officer Michiel de Rauter, were arrested on charges for treason uh, by the pro-Orangist contingent. Just two weeks later, on the 20th of August, the De Witt brothers were surrounded by a rioting mob in The Hague, just across from the Binnenhof. They were beaten, stabbed, hung up by their feet, and their bodies were left to be mutilated and lynched by the angry mob. There are even some reports of a bit of cannibalism, people cutting off bits of their body and eating it. Uh, so in August of 1672, they are finally replaced by Willem III of Orange, um, as uh, the Stadthalter again, thus ending the Stadthalterless period. So needless to say, the De Witts are a contentious uh, duo, a contentious set of brothers. You are either very pro uh, De Witt or anti De Witt, being pro Orange or anti Orange, and their names will come up again later. It is in this context of this very disastrous year that the publishers Jakob van Meurs and the combined forces of Johannes Jansonius van Weisberg and Johannes van Sommeren raced against one another to publish the lavish folio-sized illustrated accounts of India, one by Ulfer Dapper and Philip Baldeus, respectively. And here um, in the middle is the, um, the satirical print about the De Witts and the uh, havoc that was wreaked in the, the Rampiar and the title pages of Ulfred Dapper on the left and uh, Philip Baldeus on the right. Um, Ulfred Dapper was an armchair traveler and prolific author who never left the Netherlands, although wrote text on every continent in the world, uh, all of them full folio sized, very lavishly designed um, and heavily compiled text that he wrote. Philip Baldeus, um, so over Dapper here on the left, Philip Baldeus over here on the right, uh, was a reformed minister who uh, traveled with the Dutch East India Company and was a minister who uh, lived in Batavia starting in 1656 and then Jaffna, Ceylon, now present day Sri Lanka, and much of India between 1656 and 1666. Uh, before he then returned to Den Haag uh, and ultimately Hervleit, where he was appointed by Cornelius de Witt, uh, who we talked about, uh, who I talked about just a moment ago, to a church uh, um, where he ministered and he wrote his account uh, before his death in 1671. Now, neither Baldeus nor Dapper's accounts were the first illustrated Dutch accounts of the Indian subcontinent but the contributions of Dapper and Baldeus mark significant contributions to a more well-rounded European understanding of Hindu deities and Hindu cosmography. Previous scholarship, previous scholarship on these two texts and the topic of illustrated travel books on India more generally um, has just has confirmed that both Baldeus and Dapper were reusing and even plagiarizing previous text, both uh, published uh, versions and manuscript form. It is generally agreed upon that Dapper's text and images are based on miniatures and manuscripts that are now part of the Sir Hans Sloan collection in London. Uh, as you see here, the image of the uh, Matthias avatar or the first avatar of Vishnu, his printed version on the left, uh, and then the colored version uh, just below and to the right of it. Um, and this is what he used for the parts on the 10 avatars of Vishnu. He used other texts uh, that had been published for other parts of his India account. And then for Baldeus, uh, it has been confirmed through a faculty member now here at Leiden uh, through her dissertation that his account was based on and nearly directly uh, plagiarized from uh, Philip Ong 
Philips Angell's account of De called Dex Avatar or the 10 Avatars, which is held by the Postal Red Sea Abbey in Belgium. And here is his first avatar of Vishnu, the Matsya Avatar. Uh, so all of all four of these are Matsya Avatars. And uh, to the left of his portrait is his printed version. And to the lower right or lower left of that is the uh, version of the Matsya Avatar from the Philips Angel Dex Avatars. I will mention um, and give thanks a, a quickly to Gary Schwartz, if he happens to be here, who gave me access to the colored image. Here, uh, scholars have not been able to see colored images or the original version of this particular manuscript um, until very, very recently. Um, and being here on the crest, I will hopefully be able to see it very soon, but this is what his are based on. Um, so that scholarship has already been done. Um, other scholarship has been on the undeniable presence of exoticism in these works. Um, what I am discussing today, however, is the context uh, in which these books were produced, uh, and I'm working more in depth on this in my dissertation as well, is really tethering these two books to the context of their production, the background of their publishers and the engravers, and the inescapable reality of the year in which they were produced, 1672. Before Baldeus and Dapper's works were printed in 1672, there was only one version of the 10 avatars of Vishnu printed in Europe. These images first appeared in 1667, accompanying the text of famed Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who is also an armchair writer. In his text, China Illustrata, Kircher explains the simple schematic line drawings. Um, he in, can, uh, explains about the simple schematic line drawings of the avatars of Vishnu with Latin and Devangari uh, labels uh, based on a set of miniatures that were brought to him by the missionary Father Heinrich Roth, who lived in Agra, India from 1652 to 1668. Um, and Father Roth brought those back to Rome with him. Unfortunately, the originals have not been located uh, and seem not to have survived, but the print and ver printed version, um, which were used in uh, Kircher's larger project, show uh, shared origins um, of the world's religions. And so his overall project was not specifically India, but was showing all of the Asian religions and how they have similar roots. And so is comparing things to, um, comparing India to China, to Egypt, et cetera. Um, as you can see here, um, and if you are familiar with the avatars of Vishnu, Kircher's versions uh, are, mislabeled and uh, not, uh, and they're also misunderstood, they're misordered. Um, and it seems to not be of much relevance within um, Kircher's work. It is later uh, corrected by a letter by another Jesuit missionary, uh, Father Gruber, uh, but that is of little relevance today. The reason I bring this up is that it was first published in 1667 uh, by Johannes Jansonius von Weisberg, uh, the publisher of Baldeus, along with another publisher, the widow of jo uh, Johannes von Weierstrass. This publication of Kircher's China Illustrata was a full uh, folio book that was lavishly illustrated and according to their records of the publisher, quote, obtained many copies at very great excessive cost, which they themselves had also to bring over from Italy and having many expensive plates made for that purpose, end quote. In the very same year, Johannes, uh, sorry, in the very same year, Jakob van Meurs, the publisher of Dapper, also located in Amsterdam, published Kircher's exact same book uh, with the exact same illustrations without privileges. So here you see the with privileges on the cover page for the van Weisberg. Uh, there are no privileges for that Meurs, both published in 1667, you can see that their colophons and title pages are virtually identical other than the names of the publishers and whether or not there are privileges. The contents of the books are also identical. I have included here uh, the colophon, the uh, list of illustrations, the inclusion of Brahma, who is another deity in the Hindu pantheon, each of the avatars of Vishnu, all misordered, um, the portrait of Kircher, 
and uh, the first page of his um, uh, transcription of the Lord's Prayer from Sanskrit into uh, to Latin. And here is the exact same, but from uh, instead of the version with privileges, which were paid for and uh, a legally binding agreement, uh, here they are exactly the same in um, the version by Van Meurs. So on uh, June 27th, 1667, Van Weisberg and Van Weierstraat uh, sued Van Meurs for publishing Ch uh, Kircher's China Illustrata. On July 18th, 1667, Johannes Jansonius van Weisberg um, had acquired the rights in the name of his late father and the widow van Weierstraat again sought privileges, this time for a work of Athanasius Kircher, um, sorry, uh, to reprint it again, um, and were given privileges at this time for the well-known Jesuit, quote, to take away all sinister interpretations, unquote, which might arise from the obscure designation of the first privileges. In both versions, Van Meurs' uh, pirated version and Van Weisberg's, uh, the avatars of Vishnu are identical, misordered, and far less elaborate than those that appear later on. These, interestingly though, these exact same avatars of Vishnu appear in Abraham Rogerius's reprinting uh, account of his time in India. Um, this is much after his death, and it's a French translation that are published by um, Johannes Skipper in um, 1670 in Leiden. Uh, they appear to be collated into a single fold-out page. Uh, and I bring this up only because there are um, notarial records linking a debt of Van Weisberg to the widow of Skipper. So this appears to be a sort of apology publication or apology gift of the prince um, after the uh, after the privileges are given in a completely different context even though the text of Rogerius correctly identifies the avatars correctly orders them and explains them so it's a bit confusing to include this image so the legal battle the legal battle over Athanasius Kircher's book seems to spur on a heated competition between Jakob van Meurs and Johannes Jansonius van Weisberg. The final 1672 published product, uh, products and the archival records in the intervening five years indicate that both were determined to win the next match between the two publishers. By March 8, 1669, Johannes Jansonius van Weisberg had teamed up with another publisher in Amsterdam, Johannes van Sommeren, and had signed their first contract on the Baldeus India project. At this time, the project was much larger than the finished version. A, not a notarial record notes it will appear in, quote, two or three or more volumes in folio, end quote, under the title Asiographia. Um, there's a much longer title, but Asiographia is the, the quick title describing the whole of Asia, particularly the sea coast along Goa, the whole of the Malabar coast, uh, and Ceylon as described by Philip Baldeus, a servant of Jesus Christ, um, of his time in the kingdom of Ceylon and now living in Kierfleet. In addition to this work, they were also publishing in combination with an author, Lambertus Bidlow. This project uh, is, according to the record, having a great cost because of the printing of the work of the books, as well as the work of others. This document also denotes the publisher's apprehension given the excessive costs um, when others have reprinted their work in spite of having been granted privileges. Not that they're salty or upset about the previous uh, year's um, uh, misprinting or uh, pirating. The document notes that the need for the employees to be respectively authorized and patented um, and that the publishers had our right to knowledge of their interactions. By March 18th, Van Weisberg um, had received uh, privileges, uh, Van Weisberg and Van Sommer had received privileges to publish Valdeus over the next 15 years. Um, and in May 1669, um, Valdeus began writing his Afkotari, which is the section in which he includes uh, the description of Hinduism 
and, and the Malabar languages, which he finishes um, between 1670 um, with his dedication uh, to Cornelius de Witt in 1671, in August 15th, 1671. Again, the de Witts, who I mentioned earlier. Baldeus died later that year and never saw the finished publish, uh, published version of his text. It is even possible that he never saw the engravings that accompanied his words. Sources disagree exactly when Baldeus, uh, Baldeus, Baldeus's day of death, but it is somewhere between September of 1671 and March of 1672. On July 28, 1670, Jacob van Meurs um, um, receives privileges um, for his text um, uh, by Dopper. The privileges document uh, demonstrated that like von Weisberg's and von Sommerin's, von Meurs's original project is much grander. Dopper's text is meant to cover all of Asia, the title being Groot and Klein, uh, and Klein Asia, or uh, Asia Major and Minor, if you will. Although Baldeus had died, many events happened in the disaster year that shaped the finished product of both of these books and the careers of their publishers, uh, of the publishers who produced them. 1672 was not a good year for many reasons, but for selling big, lavish, and expensive books um, in particular. So the publishers had to do um, what they could to save themselves from being, uh, save themselves financially. Having been burned by Van Meurs in uh, 67, Van Weisberg and Van Sommeren uh, gave their engraver a contract of exclusivity. Uh, the contract makes very clear that the project uh, for Baldeus's book and any etching or engravings that Conrad Decker uh, makes are for the benefit of the book, even if the designs or plates are not used. Uh, he cannot share them. And the contract specifically prohibits Decker's contact, visual or verbal, with Jakob van Meurs. Um, and this is the notarial record right here. Uh, Johannes van Sommeren and van Weisberg and Conrad Decker, their engraver, I'll sign it. Um, and uh, within the text itself, it specifically cites Van Meurs. Um, on the 6th of April, uh, 1672, Jakob Van Meurs and Jansonius uh, Van Weisberg are pulled together um, with another contract, and they are meant to submit all of their disputes beginning in the year 1670 through the 15th of December, 1672, to the decision of a S. Hillis Rocha and a Johann Schott. Uh, by August 20th, uh, 1672, Cornelis de Witt and his brother Johann de Witt are lynched in Den Haag. And I want to note here that, um, and this may be not the best uh, slide, I minimized it from earlier, but I can go back. Uh, both of these books published in 1672 are dedicated to Cornelis de Witt um, and both of them privileges are granted by Johann de Witt. So they're um, in, in, uh, um, unretractably linked to them and they must be uh, published in such a time that uh, either it was too late to change it or, um, uh, or the damage had been done or possibly it was right before uh, the downfall of the de Witts. Uh, it's important to note that Cornelius de Witt uh, the dedication to him from Baldeus was written in 1671. Uh, Cornelius de Witt was the one who got Philip Baldeus's job in Carefleet, uh, so it explicitly thanks him for that, uh, the naming of that position. It's unclear exactly why um, Cornelius de Witt was cho chosen as the dedicatee from Dapper. Many of Dapper's other books are actually dedicated to the Witzen family, uh, a major family of collectors uh, and merchants. Uh, but certainly there seems to be something of continued competition in the naming and um, the keeping of these dedications. Um, so here are, oops, here are the um, avatars of Vishnu uh, that are created by Kunrat Decker for the text of Philip Aldeus. They are meant to be based on uh, the versions uh, by Philip Zangel. Um, there are clearly some changes. Uh, something notable about this that I will get into in later projects and in later parts of my dissertation, in particular, are 
the absence of darkness of Vishnu's skin, uh, as a, that is something that is noted in the text. Some scholars think that Baldeus's uh, version, which is interesting, we even call it Baldeus's version because he likely never saw these engravings, uh, but these images uh, seem to, and his text seem to link more uh, parallels of Vishnu with that of Jesus Christ and Christianity. Dapper's versions, which are likely by the hand of Jakob van Meurs, as he was an engraver himself. We don't have any other attributed artists, um, but are much more Europeanized, much more um, fantastical. There's far more difference from their uh, attributed uh, models. Uh, but we see here that Vishnu in some of the um, avatars, the Matsya, uh, the fish, the Kurma, uh, the um, turtle, as well as the Krishna here, um, avatar all have dark skin. Uh, same with the Kalki, the 10th avatar, um, as he is meant to, but he's shown more as an African uh, individual, uh, much more uh, muscular mm -hmm. and uh, the same scholars that create the parallel uh, or, or say that Valdez is creating the parallel of Vishnu to Christ say that uh, the attribution here is uh, more analogous to that of the devil. Uh, there are much more scary, more violent versions of the avatars of Vishnu. He uh, has slightly different uh, interpretations, and this could be in part from um, lack of awareness and having never traveled and seen uh, the practices of Hinduism. Um, but regardless, uh, both texts were published in the same year, 1672. Uh, it's unclear which one came out first, who really beat the other to the punch. Um, and ironically, uh, Ben Mers and Ben Sommerin become business partners after the death of Johannes van Weisberg. Uh, they become business partners in 1675, likely because they're both uh, further in debt than they would like mm. to be. Um, they publish accounts together in 1675 on the Republic's war against France and England, uh, dealing very specifically with Het Rampiar, um, and later accounts of um, East India Company uh, uh, exploits, uh, some of them more adventurous rather than um, as uh, lavishly decorated, trying to make more money, uh, the uh, Van Weisberg and Van Sommeren business uh, continues to publish through the 1670s. Uh, but by the time Van Meurs dies, it's clear that um, he at least was not very successful. There are at least 500 copies of his description of Asia by Dapper in his inventory when he dies um, as, uh, in Dutch, as well as um, at least 300 versions in German. Um, and many other, um, he has far too many uh, books he, uh, in his um, inventory so that he hasn't sold and he is not able to even pay the dowry of to his daughter's marriage and that is indebted to his business partners. So ultimately uh, they pushed through to both uh, lose in the disaster year and just to reinforce with this last slide that um, the engravers are very much thinking about the disaster year. Here is the same engraver as Philip Baldeus's um, avatars of Vishnu doing the allegory of the death of the Devits. So reinforcing how important that is, even to the very engraver of Baldeus's text. Um, so ultimately, it seems as if no one one at this point. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it, it's interesting to see how 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 that works. That that, that kind of very strange world. If you look at the look at the illustration, so close to 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 the Dutch context, top context, political context of the, the Rampiar, and how that get intermingled very very uh, specifically. So thank you very much. Uh, all questions are more than welcome. Uh, I first, first want, want to, to uh, point, point is, there is there still an echo, Noah? I think the echo is gone, right? I turned off the volume on my side. All right, good. Uh, uh, maybe I just turn out my volume.
turn on yours so okay. i think we can still hear each other like that yeah all right uh so all questions more than welcome uh, please please do ask but i do have a first question because i saw some people of uh uh, inside this room, and they are, of course, the authors of that new wonderful book, Concophilia, Shells, Art and Curiosity in Early Modern Europe, uh, edited by Marissa Bass, and Goldgar, Hanke Grotevoer, and Claudia Swan. How do you, how do you relate your work, uh, Cindy, to, 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 to that late book, that, that very early, uh, that new book? Um, that book has been an amazing resource, and I think they deal with a lot of the broader questions of the meaning of shells and different types of shell collecting in the Dutch Republic around the same time. And I think the shift I am making is I'm focusing on Mother of Pearl as a resource and less so on the more um, the collecting of more refined shells. So um, and in my talk, I was trying to make that distinction slightly between mm -hmm. nautilus shells and mother of pearl nautilus shells are hard to find they're usually found when like the creature has died and the shell is floated up to the sea so there isn't a really so systematic way of acquiring them whereas mother of pearl in the form of pearl oyster shells um come as a byproduct of the pearl trade yes. and so there it comes in a lot in a in larger volume i think that gives crafts people more flexibility to work with it and not worry so much about ruining the product mm -hmm. although they do the pelicans do carve a lot of novelists sure. also then a small question cindy uh the 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 work is not signed or is it signed and if it's not signed how do you know it's by pelican that's a great huge question that i am still dealing with um they are sometimes signed but even then like how do you know if the signature is accurate or um, it ties into questions I have about workshop practice and whether or not they were actually training other people to work in this material also. So um, for the Perseus and the Dromda shells I was looking at, I based what I was saying off of previous scholarship, such as Van Setters, who, um, who I think makes these attributions based on style and also um, the shells come up sometimes in um, what is it called? Death inventories, like house in inventories, things like that, where they'll say something like a shell carved with Perseus and Dromda by Cornelius Bellican. And then you can make a guess that perhaps it is the shell. But um, the, the shells are also sometimes signed. And I think um, what I was interested in getting at in this talk is how um, the sign, both the signing and then also the way they do the carvings, a lot of it is. Um, the worker, the mother of pearl workers looking mm -hmm. to print and taking a lot of those print conventions in their own work. All right, thank you. Two questions for Maggie. Why is it so important, uh, Marika Kibusek asks, to know who published first? Is that so very relevant? Uh, great question. Um, in a sense, it's not, although I think they thought it was uh, with the, the severity of their competition. Um, uh, amongst each other. I think, um, if anything, it's important to understand um, they had overlapping markets, target markets. So um, if one were to come out first uh, and uh, the the money one had to spend was limited, they might box the other one out of the sales uh, because they're very overlapping. They have very similar um, sources, uh, they're very similar texts. Um, uh, so if you could only budget for one in a year, uh, you might buy the first one rather than the yes. second. Um, and I think for, uh, to a certain extent, um, it mattered to uh, the publishers um, in terms of their own egos and legacies. Uh, but uh, historically speaking, uh, outside of the context of um, the success of the publishers and authors, uh, I suppose it doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, in terms of the avatars of Vishnu specifically, uh, and I, I spoke about this in another talk um, about a month ago, um, it seems as if Baldeus uh, won in a, in a certain regard in that uh, by the time Bernard and Picard uh, are publishing their uh, uh, seven um later nine volume compendium of all the religions of the world it's actually the kircher slash rocarius 
uh, avatars of Vishnu and then the Baldeus that um, by Decker that are repeated um, and reused. Uh, other images from elsewhere in Dapper's Asia are reproduced, but his avatars of Vishnu um, are uh, left out of th that canon um, at that point. So um, ultimately that seems to be not what came first so much as uh, what was deemed um, the more accurate or more um, long lasting um, in, in the opinion of Bernard and Picard. Yes. Another question by Bram van Leuven. You hinted at this already, but to what extent did the books of those Dutch armchair authors reflect and or relate to the violent exploits of the Dutch in South Asia? Uh, also a great question. Um, unfortunately, very little. Um, the 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 reality uh, of the the lives of the South Asians that are being um, infringed upon, um, interacted with, um, are are left to a very um, uh, either subjective level of how they can be interesting subjects for these books, or um, trying to uh, encourage further. Uh, mercantile interaction. Um, so it, it seems as if um, what was known of the violence was um, very much minimized, uh, whether you were an armchair traveler or you traveled yourself. Uh, of the text that I work on, it's about 50-50 between armchair travelers and those who traveled, um, and both definitely minimize it. And maybe the um, uh, the those who traveled probably minimize it even more, actually. Um, but it really is not um, discussed very much. And unfortunately, some of the dedications of the books are dedicated to some of the worst offenders, the Baldeus that I mentioned. Uh, no, sorry, not the Baldeus. The, the Philip Sangel um, that I mentioned is actually dedicated to uh, Reichla van Hoons, uh, who is one of the worst offenders um, and, and committed uh, or ordered the committing of the most murders in mm -hmm. South Asia. So um, unfortunately, uh, the violence is um, ignored and or um, tangentially celebrated. Yes. All right, then we're just finishing in time. Thank you both very, very much for this fascinating, fascinating talk. Also you online, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. Next week, that's Wednesday, uh, 29th September, at 18 hours Amsterdam time, we have as our guest Lizzie Marks of the Maori's House, who will talk about the exhibition Fleeting Sense in Color. So I hope to see you all there. Have a nice evening or a nice day for our friends in, uh, on the other side of the ocean and see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>